Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about how to understand the record indexes on Ancestry. It's really important to furthering your family history research to understand uh, how the record indexes are created, what they are, how they're created, and then how to use them to best further your family history research. So let's go ahead and dive in. We're going to start um, by just talking about um, how many records there are available on Ancestry. Uh, as of today, this is uh, January of 2017, there are 19 billion historical records available on Ancestry. Every time I say that out loud, it blows my mind. Um, I've been with the company now for almost 13 years and have seen that number grow uh, exponentially over the years. The other number that kind of uh, boggles my mind is that Ancestry is adding an average of 2 million new records every single day. So uh, as the record, as the database size grows, we have to account for a lot of different kinds of records. Those records are coming to Ancestry in all different forms and formats. We have to turn those into an index. So what is an index? Well, an index is just simply a searchable way to find a record. Now, um, when we do family history research in libraries or archives, a lot of times we pull a book from a shelf, we flip to the back of the book to read the index to see what page the information is in the book that we need. Similar to um, going to a card catalog or any kind of other indexing feature that allows us to actually locate a record. That's all an index is, is it's just a searchable way to find a record. Now in the digital age, a lot of times what that means is you're typing in a certain search query into a search form to load a series of records that meet that criteria. Now we're not going to dive too much into search today uh, because this this foundational concept is just about how the indexes are created so that you can understand how better to search. One thing to understand is that an index is typically, actually in almost every case, not a transcription of that record. And that's really important to understand because a lot of people look at an index and they think this is the record. No, the index is designed to get you to the record. So the purpose of creating an index is just to give you enough information that you can say, this might be my person, I need to go now look at the original record. So if you keep those two things in mind, an index is just a searchable way to find a record, and it is not a complete transcription of the record, then you can move forward with your family history research. Let's talk about how the indexes here at Ancestry are created. There are several different ways that Ancestry has records indexed. One is that we receive them already indexed. So some kind of organization, governmental organization or archive or library or family history society or other group or organization has created an index of a series of uh, records that are genealogically pertinent and Ancestry purchase that, purchases that index or acquires that index from that organization and is able to publish that index online with permission. A great example of this is the Social Security Death Index. The Social Security Death Index, um, if you, let's just do a little detour here for a second. We're going to go into the card catalog. If you're not familiar with that, I've done a video on that. You might want to go spend a few minutes watching that. Basically, the card catalog is just the quickest way to find anything uh, on Ancestry if you're looking for a specific set of indexed records. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to type in Social Security. So we have the Social Security Death Index. The Social Security Death Index um, is for anybody who had a Social Security number in the United States and whose death was reported to the Social Security Administration. And so you can come in here and you can type in a name and it will pull up a uh, search results. That's what these are. These are just search results. And then you click on any one of these to get the index to the record. Now this is not uh, the record itself. This is just an index to the records that are held by the Social Security uh, Administration. Okay, so the Social Security Administration, and you, and you learn that by reading the database description. So if you scroll down below the search box on the search form, 
or below the search result, the index page, you're going to see here the source citation, the source information, the database description. Very often that will tell you exactly where Ancestry obtained this record, and that gives you clues to how it might have been indexed. So in this case, this Social Security death index record um, is for you know this individual, and it gives us some information about her last residence, her birth date, her death date, and the year that her social security number was issued. Ancestry received this index from the Social Security Administration with this information. So why is that important? Well, one is if any of this information is inaccurate, Ancestry can't do anything about that because this is a government record that we received uh, with this information. So if you need something on it changed, you need to contact that original organization. The second reason it's important to know that is, remember, this is just an index. An index's job is to help you find the original record. So while this gives you some great information, it might not be enough information to determine if this record is actually for your person or not. So you can contact the Social Security Administration and order a copy of the original Social Security application that is where most of this detail came from. The only two pieces of information that did not come from that are the death date and the last residence. Those typically came from the administration based on how the death was reported to them and where they were paying out benefits or sending statements before uh, the person died. So understanding again how these records were indexed helps you understand what to do next with those particular records. Social Security Death Index is just one example. I could give you dozens, but understanding that there are certain sets of records where Ancestry receives them already indexed. One of the quickest ways uh, to tell most often is, is there an image attached? In the, in the case of the Social Security Administration index records, there's no image attached, it's just an index. If it's just an index, chances are Ancestry received it that way from whoever the original record holder might be. Now, a large bulk of our records, probably the majority of our records, are actually manually indexed, which means a person has to look at every single image and every single record on that image and type in what is seen on that record. And that helps us create the index. So think about things like census records, passenger lists, draft cards, anything where there's an image on Ancestry, somebody has gone in and manually typed that information in. So we can come into a census record, for example, or a census database. We'll come here to the 1870 census, and we can uh, do a search in the index for somebody with some information, and we can pull up uh, from the search results, we can come to the index page. This is That's all this is. It's just a, a record page or an index to the record. It is not the original record. The original record, you can see, is actually um, viewable over here on the left-hand side. So I can click on that and I can open up the original record. Now remember, an index is a finding aid to the record. It is not necessarily a transcription of everything on the record. The purpose of the index is to get you to the record. So in this case, where Ancestry has the records available to us and that they've been made available to us by whatever agency owns them, and then we have created an index ourselves to those records, we're able to provide you with both pieces of information. But you still want to always go and view the original image. In this case, we can come here and we can see, you know, is this record for my person? We can do a record analysis on this. Um, you know, do I have other family members living in this town in this particular location? Is, you know, is this my family? Are there families living near them? What is the construction of the family? Who's living in the household? Why are there people living in the household that have a different last name? Lots of a record analysis, which is part of the genealogical proof standard. Lots of record analysis can go uh, into that when you have the original record available to you. So Ancestry uh, creates these, um, these indexes. Um, when there's an image available, it is an almost certainty that Ancestry has created these particular indexes. 
Okay, so there's a couple of ways that Ancestry does that. One is that we use professional indexers, people whose job it is, full-time profession it is, to index records. And so they've gotten really, really good at reading old historical records and keying in the information. Typically, when we give um, our professional indexers instructions about how to key things, we have to make some decisions. One is we don't typically key every single field on a record. One, because it becomes cost prohibitive, but two, because again, the index's job is just to get you to the record. And so, it, you know, it might not matter, one little piece of information might not matter in getting you to the record. So, so always view the original. So that means that when we have these professional indexers index our records, we have to make a decision about which fields on any given record to have them index or key. And that's a really tough decision. I was the indexing manager here at Ancestry uh, years ago and, and got a firsthand look at how difficult that decision can be. The other instruction that we give our indexers is to key the record as seen, which means that if it's incorrect on the record, it's going to be incorrect in the index. We don't want these indexers making um, decisions or spending time doing record analysis to make a determination if the census taker wrote it right or not, or you know, lots of different ways. And so if it says that this person is a male, it's gonna, they're gonna type in male, even if you know it's a female. If it says that this last name is spelled P-E-L-L-Y, even if you know it's spelled P-O-L-L-Y, we're gonna put what's on the record itself. Okay, so they're not making interpretations, they are just doing, in, in many cases, a letter-by-letter letter transcription. So that's why sometimes you see things that might be spelled wrong or information that might be incorrect in an index. It's typically because that is what was seen by the person who indexed the record. Now you may see, look at the record and see something entirely different. And that's typically because you have the context. This record is likely for your family member. And so you understand what that, you know, that that's an O, not an E, because it's your family. But an indexer would look at that with no context and not necessarily know that. So keep that in mind. That's gonna help your searching to understand the letters that might look alike, that might get misinterpreted as they are being indexed. That's going to help you. Also to understand the letters that, um, that might sound alike, that a census taker or a person recording a passenger list, the way they might write it, if they didn't, if the person didn't know how to spell their own name, if they were just listening to it and writing it down. That becomes particularly important when you're dealing with different accents between the, the speaker and the hearer uh, as they record information. So keep that in mind. So that is one of the ways in which Ancestry creates indexes is we use professional indexers who do this for a living and they create those indexes. We also have a program called the World Archives Project. Now the World Archives Project is something that anyone can participate in. They can come and they can key or index records that we've made available through that project. Every single record there is keyed by an individual and then arbitrated by an experienced keyer. If there's some conflict or some uh, confusion, there's also kind of a, an audit level done on those records. So anybody can help create indexes. Now we don't make every single record collection available through the World Archives Project, uh, mostly because um, a limited number of resources are available there. If you want to participate, that increases uh, the number of resources available there. But the cool thing about the World Archives Project indexes is that anything that has been indexed through that project, those indexes are made available for free on Ancestry. So Ancestry, in those 19 billion historical records, has a subset of databases that are entirely free whether you have a subscription or not or if you only have a US subscription and some of these international records that have the, where the indexes have been created by the World Archives Project, those databases are free. Now, one of the easiest ways to figure out if a collection is included or has been indexed by the World Archives Project um, is just simply, again, in the card catalog to do a search 
um, I have to remember where we hid that information, um, to do a search in uh, the card catalog to see if you can pull up some of those records. In the database description, you're going to see this collection was indexed by Ancestry World Archives Project contributors. And you can click that link and that will actually take you to a page where you can sign up to contribute to the project um, by indexing some of those records. I strongly encourage you, if you've never indexed before, just to at least try it. Going through the process of reading keying instructions and trying to index a batch or two of records is really informative uh, about how indexes are created. It also gives you a little bit of em empathy for some of the struggles that some of the indexers have in trying to read the old handwriting or you know make sense out of a census taker's uh, scribblings. And um, it's just a really great process to get you used to reading old handwriting. So if you're new to family history, you haven't spent a lot of time with a lot of old documents, you can sign up for the World Archives Project you can go there and you can look at the different records that are currently being indexed and you can select which project you want to work on uh, in whatever language, whatever record type. Um, it looks like we've got a few projects here in process, one for Australia, some Pennsylvania tax records. So these are the, the collections that are currently, uh, currently being worked on and you can uh, go through that process. It'll teach you a lot about how record indexing occurs just, just to do it once or twice. So uh, looking again at this database description to understand which collections have been indexed by that, um, that contributor community. So those are two ways records are indexed. We receive them indexed, they're manually indexed by somebody who reads every record and types in the information. And then the third way that records are indexed on Ancestry is what we call optical character recognition or OCR. OCR means that a page with records on it of some sort is in such a format that we can program a computer program to read those words. So typically this is going to be with um, type set documents, city directories, phone books, yearbooks, newspapers, anything that is in a, a standard format and that is typeset in such a way that a computer could read that page um, is, is what's going to, to be OCR'd. There is uh, you know, some variables in that that determine how good the OCR output or the index quality comes out. And one of those has to do with how clean the image is. So one of the record collections that Ancestry has run through OCR is our US City Directories database. This database uh, spans from 1822 to 1995, and this single database has 1.5 billion historical records in this single database. And the reason we're able to put that many records up that fast is because it's a computer reading every single page. So I can come in here and I can type in the name of a particular ancestor and it will bring up a list of, um, of some things. Now one of the things you're gonna notice about OCR content or OCR indexes is that sometimes it's gonna pick up weird things. Again, it's a computer reading it, so there's not some of that human contextuality that can be automatically given. And so sometimes you'll get little abbreviations in the middle of an index. Um, sometimes you'll get uh, initials or codes that don't make uh, entire sense right away. Sometimes it will read an ad as if it was a name because the computer's trying to not just read every word on the page, but also then parse those words into specific records. This is a first name, this is a last name, this is a residence, this is a location. And that gets a little tricky, but because we can do that, we can index millions and millions of records a lot faster and get them available online. And as a genealogist, I would rather have the records online and available for a rough search that I can then refine or even just get the images online so that I can go and browse through the images one at a time to find the information than to have these records buried in an archive somewhere uh, where they are inaccessible to me or only accessible if I take a fairly expensive research trip. I've done my share of those in my day. 
So if we come to an image that we would OCR, you're going to see exactly why there are sometimes some problems. One of the, the struggles that we have, you'll notice sometimes these records have a ditto mark. Now we can train a computer software program to, to recognize that when there's a ditto mark, it refers to this surname up here. One of the challenges though is that the surname is in a larger font and it's all caps. Um, here though, however, in this particular record, there is no ditto mark, but sometimes the ditto mark is so faint it can't be seen. So the computer wasn't sure whether this person this was a person, because it's a word at the beginning of a, of a line, was a Park Cowan, when in fact it's actually 1433 Park Place. It's the address for this individual. But this individual's in bold, and it's in a little bit larger font, right? So you have all these variables through these records, and that's true of city directories, that's true of newspapers, it's true of yearbooks. And so we do our best to train the software to be able to read a page and parse out records for our index, and we're able to get millions and millions of records processed that way. But sometimes you end up with quirky little things. Either way, it got me to a page of Cowens in Wichita, in 1963 and I'm able to look through this and see if there are other records of interest to me. So that is our OCR content. Uh, like city directories are really clean, they're really usually really neat, the images aren't typically skewed. The OCR quality varies like I said based on the quality of the image. Is it clear? Is it crisp? Are there a lot of printing artifacts on the image or not? When you start dealing with old newspapers, it gets even trickier. Sometimes those images are skewed because that's the way they were originally microfilmed and the original newspaper itself doesn't actually exist anymore for us to go and re-image it. Sometimes the ink is smeared and so the letters are difficult for the computer to distinguish and so, like I said, we do our best with the software and the software does its best, but that optical character recognition uh, is how a lot of records are processed and how a lot of the indexes on Ancestry are created. Then finally, as just kind of a final step, after each of these processes, Ancestry does on the back end some automated augmentation, meaning we take that information and we create some additional information in the index to allow you to search it. The easiest uh, way to explain this is with an example from the U.S. Federal Census. Uh, typically, the U.S. Federal Census only lists an age for an individual. So it'll say this person was this old at this time. Ancestry, actually, our, our indexers key that age, but then we know, you know, if this person was 30 in the 1920 census, then they were born about 1890. And so we will create an augmented index entry for birth year of 1890. So it'll still have the age as keyed by the manual indexer, but then it'll have an augmented index field of birth year so that we can, we can process that or so that you can find that a little bit better. So we do some of those back-end processes on some of our indexes. Another type of index augmentation that we do has to do with parents' names on a record. So this is a fairly new thing that we have introduced, and you're gonna notice it most on birth, marriage, and death records. So if I come in here um, and pull up a social security claim application as an example, Anytime there is a record where there are multiple people named on that record. So this record is for this individual, Catherine. But because it's a social security application, it also lists her parents' names. Again, this is going to be true of birth, marriage, and death records most often. In this case, this is um, a social security application. Uh, when they make a claim on that social security number, typically that's going to include death information like this does. So anytime there's multiple people listed on a record, one of the augmentation steps that Ancestry is doing with our records is creating secondary records for every individual listed on that record which means if I had searched for Jesse Fisher, I would get this index. Now this index doesn't tell me much. It looks like 
what is this information, right? Um, it's a social security claim application and it says it's for Jesse Fisher. No, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is the name Jesse Fisher appears on whatever the record is. Remember, the index's job is to get you to the record. So one of the things you might want to consider doing is clicking through every name on a record to see what information shows up. Because if it looks like there's limited information on Jessie or her husband Irvin, what you may discover is when you click on Catherine, you get the full index of the information from that record. So that's one of the steps that Ancestry has taken in our augmentation process in order to help you find records faster and easier. Because remember, the index's job is to help you find the record. And so we want you to find those records. If all you knew was that there was somebody named Jessie Fisher and she's the daughter and you know the daughter of your great grandparents, well, this might lead you to the name of her husband and the names of her children by coming to the record from a different direction. So that augmented, um, that automated augmentation that we do on the back end just helps improve those indexes and improve, improve the searchability. And really that is one of the things that we hope for as genealogists more than anything is just to be able to get to records better, faster, um, smarter. And so Ancestry is always looking at ways to do that. And as a genealogist who, who spends all day, every day, just about uh, doing family history research, I've learned lots of little tips and tricks into the records. I've done a few videos on that. If you haven't watched those, I would encourage you to go to the Ancestry YouTube channel, do a little search there on search, and you'll see a few videos that I've done on some of my favorite search tips and tricks. The other thing that the record indexes allow us to do is to do better record analysis. We really need to be spending time looking at every field and understanding the record itself and how that information correlates with the other things we know about our family. That's going to make sure that we're identifying the right people, that we're entering the correct information into our family tree, not just what was on the index, because remember what was on the index is, might not be complete and it might not be accurate. What's on the original record might not be complete and might not be accurate. So that record analysis step in the genealogical proof standard is really important to make sure that we're entering correct information into our family tree and ultimately to make sure that we're climbing our own family tree, not somebody else's. And then the other thing about the record indexes is that they help us know what to do next. Always scroll down to that source information, that database description. It's going to help you understand the record. It's going to help you know where to find the original record if Ancestry does not have the image available. And sometimes there's even next steps included in that database description about exactly what this record tells you and what the next step should be in your research. Well, that's all I have for you today. Hopefully this was useful information. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments here on YouTube. I will keep an eye on those and answer them as I can. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.